Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you guys. Looking forward to continuing our series this summer, going through the Psalms. Uh, we'll we'll uh, go through five of them this summer. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and flip to Psalm 3. Psalm 3. We're going to be diving into Psalm 3 uh, momentarily. But the purpose of going through the Psalms is to like look at them in a devotional way, uh, almost like I believe Jesus would have read through and looked at the Psalms in a devotional way, where he learned a lot about himself going through the Psalms as he's doing that, which I'm uh, praising God for. My hope would be for us to grow in our adoration of Jesus, our oddness of Jesus as we go through the Psalms. May, uh, may that be the case. May we long for Jesus more than we long for anything else. That's my hope for, for our church family, um, always actually. But um, we looked at the first two Psalms uh, so far, Psalm 1, Psalm 2. And notice that they were a bit of like an overview or a big scan back kind of look at the Psalms and of the scriptures in general. Psalm 1, we notice that there was this contrast between the righteous person and the wicked person. And we learned that the righteous person wasn't righteous because of their good works or moral behavior. They were righteous because they relied on God. Uh, people who were deemed wicked, according to Psalm 1, were wicked because they wanted autonomy from God. They wanted self-rule from God. Not that they did horrible things, which opened my mind, opened my eyes. Psalm 2 kind of zoomed in a little bit about that wicked man. They used the language of kings, looked at kings who were angry at God, were rebelling against God and his oversight, wanting autonomy. Uh, and so... Uh, the second psalm talked about joy, talked about God being our refuge, and how those who live desiring the autonomy, the autonomy from God is really not the joy-filled life. Joy-filled life would be among those who uh, fall under God's rule and desire God to rule their lives. And we learned a little bit more about God's anointed one in Psalm 2. So we looked at that, and that was really good. Psalm 1 and 2 kind of started and ended the same. Psalm 1 starts with, oh, the joys of those basically who follow God. Psalm 2 ends with, um, but what joy for all who take refuge in him. And I uh, thought that was a beautiful summary of people in general in the scriptures. Now, Psalm 3 is a bit different. It's, it's as if, and this is Psalm 3 kind of, is like what most of the psalms are like. Psalm 1 and 2 are very unique, but uh, that, those are like wisdom psalms. But Psalm 3 is almost as if we're getting a glimpse in the personal journal of King David. It's almost like we are just tore a piece of his journal out and we're able to read some of the struggle and what David was going through. And so it's, it's uh, kind of a privilege to read the third psalm, with that in mind, knowing we're getting a glimpse into the personal world of King David and some of the things that he uh, interacted with God and, and, uh, and whatnot. So I want to read Psalm 3. We're going to read through it in whole, and I'll go through it uh, little by little, and uh, then close our time. Father, we give you uh, our hearts, we give you our minds, we give you our expectations. We pray, Lord, that this wouldn't, I pray that this wouldn't just be knowledge that would be penned on paper, that would be forgotten. But I pray that this would uh, penetrate to belief and life change in regards to our devotion to you. I ask God that uh, you would accept what we have today as worship, as our offering to you. We bless you in this. We give you thanks uh, for this time. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to read the psalm, and I'm going to end, because I'm reading the whole psalm. I'm going to end with this phrase, thanks, uh, this is the word of the Lord. And, and that, that's an invitation for all those who receive the word of the Lord to say, thanks be to God. 
So, so that's, that's kind of, anytime I read a whole passage, I'll often close like that. Um, let's, let's dive into God's word. Uh, there's some subscripture or a superscript, if you will, that says, A Psalm of David regarding the time David fled from his son Absalom. Verse 1. O oh Lord, I have so many enemies, so many are against me. So many are saying God will never rescue him. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield around me. You are my glory, the one who holds my head high. I cried out to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept, yet I woke up in safety. For the Lord was watching over me. I am not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surround me on every side. Arise, O Lord, rescue me, my God. Slap all my enemies in the face. Shatter the teeth of the wicked. Wow. So nice. <laughs> Personal journal of King David. He's very real with his feelings. Victory comes from you, O Lord. May you bless your people. This is the word of the Lord. Awesome. We will grow in that. We will get better at that there. So cool. So um, the subscript, not every song has this little superscription kind of italicized words that say who wrote this song, what it's about. But Psalm 2 has that. And it gives us a little bit about the author of this song, uh, whose journal it was taken from, if you will, and it, in regards to what it was about. And it's connected to, to Absalom, now as one of King David's sons. He had many children. Um, this account, I would encourage you guys to read this account. It's in 2 Samuel, if you want to write this down. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 15 to 18, and you'll get a fuller picture. Like if you went home tonight and you read those three chapters, 15, 16, 17, 18, four chapters, if you were to read those four chapters and then to be looking through what you took notes on today, you would have a fuller understanding and more compassion, possibly, of what David was going through. To sum it up, I do have uh, one psalm or one verse from 2 Samuel. 1513 it says a messenger soon arrived in Jerusalem to tell David all Israel has joined Absalom in a conspiracy against you now imagine being the king the anointed one who received a crown where God's favor was upon him among all his older brothers God chose him as the anointed one receiving now this note several years later all of Israel is against you. So if you read 2 Samuel 15 through 18, those chapters, you'll get a bigger picture. But I warn you, um, there's a lot of graphic things in those chapters. So just know that. So, all right, let's dive into the, the, the scriptures here. First two verses it says, Oh Lord, I have so many enemies. So many are against me. So many are saying, quote unquote, God will never rescue him. So there's several things happening here. There's number one, rumors. If you were to read 2 Samuel, you'll know that there's a betrayal from his son, and his son is spreading rumors about David. And for some reason, people are believing. Now, some of us here in this room can probably relate to people hearing rumors and believing rumors, right? And so these individuals are hearing words about a king, about an individual outside of a scenario and situation, and they're believing the word on the street of what's happening. So there's rumors going on, there's betrayal going on, and there's taunting going on, there's disbelief in God's ability going on. All of this is happening. Now, I don't know if you can relate. If you're in a situation, you're experiencing a, 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 you know, you're in a frail place in life, and you hear someone share, you know, 
you're, you're not going to be rescued. God can't fix this. There's, there's no way out of this. You know, whatever the lie might be about God. Oftentimes, that does what for us in our minds? Discourages us, right? For some denominations, they take it as far as saying, uh, don't even speak that kind of thing. Don't give that power, right? Don't put, don't verbalize that. Don't give that power in your life. You might hear that among some denominations to say it in that way. But you, you hear these phrases, you hear these things that might bring you down, you might spiral in your thoughts. Some people might struggle with depression or anxiety, and it triggers that, right? And so you start spiraling down from there. And so David is in this place. There's a reality in David's life. Though there are rumors happening, there's a reality that many people Many people are against him. And, I mean, armies and, and, and different individuals are bringing about this pressure against David in his life. And so we find him speaking to the Lord, proclaiming the reality in his life. There are many en enemies in my life. Many are against me. So many are saying God will never rescue him. Look at, look at David's response. Look at David's response. Verse 3. But you, O Lord, are a shield around me. You are my glory, the one who holds my head high. Isn't that beautiful? He responds to lies. He responds to this heated situation where a nation is against him with proclaiming truth. Isn't that beautiful? Now, I don't know if there's relationship to the term. In the NLT, it says interlude. You'll see that. It says interlude. In other translations, you'll see the term selah. I don't know if that's purposefully placed there connected to that response. But just so you guys know, many scholars uh, cannot agree on what exactly this term means. Um, you'll, you'll see anything under the sun is it means rest. It's tied to a musical note. It means pause. It means amen. It means hallelujah or praise the Lord. And so there's a gamut of what this might refer to. So when you see interlude in the NLT, it means selah, which is some sort of pause or something going on here. Uh, it's, it's mentioned in the Psalm 71 times. It's mentioned in the book of Habakkuk three times. Minor prophet Habakkuk. Selah or interlude is mentioned three times. Oftentimes it's found in poetic writings, right? Where there would be music, instruments. So here there's a pause. There's something going on between the lies and the realities in David's life. And then there's a pause and he proclaims truth. There's three truths that David proclaims. Number one, he proclaims, let me make sure, I'm going to write that, that's where it should be. Uh, number one truth uh, David proclaims is, you are, the Lord is my shield, the shield around him. That's the first truth that's proclaimed. So he's a protector, right? David has no clue if he's going to be murdered or killed. But he says, you're my protector. If David is murdered or killed, does that mean God is not his protector? No. It doesn't. Uh, number two, second truth that's proclaimed. He says, you are my glory. So now he's speaking to God's character. Now the term glory is mentioned many times in scripture. And sometimes it's referred to like the glory of the Lord. Like literally this shininess he shones, right? But here glory is mentioned as a character or describing who God is in general. Like your majesty. You are my ma majesty. The majestic one. So he says, so he's identifying who God is. He identifies what God does. And then he says here when he does more, he says, the third truth is the one, you are the one who holds my head high. You are my strength. You are my encourager. You are my everything. So we have him as protector, his strength, and his glory. So he proclaims three truths to a lie. What are some truths that we try to teach you guys here to help us combat lies from the enemy? 
What are some truths you hear often that I share on a Sunday that will help battle lies? The four G's. Anybody want to share what those are? God is good. He's great, glorious, and gracious. He's gracious. Those are four terms. What's that? You listen. Thank you. I saw your wife whispering in your ear. You were listening very well. Just kidding. No, that's good. And those four terms, God is great, God is glorious, he's good, and he's gracious. Those four terms have taglines that say truths of who God is. God is great, so we don't have to be in control. God is glorious, so we don't have to fear what people think, which is how I can stand up here each Sunday. I can't fear what you think about me or the word I'm bringing. Otherwise, it'll paralyze me, and I will never stand up here. Uh, God is good, so I don't have to look outside of him for satisfaction. Whether it's turning to the closet, the food, the cupboard, whatever it is, I don't have to do that because God can provide for me all my needs, for all my needs. The last one is God is gracious, so I don't have to prove myself to him, to others, or myself. I don't have to rely on my performance. It's all about the performance of Jesus. So these are truths, some, some of the truths that we share to help us combat lies. These lies don't just come from rumors and, and, and people outside. These lies can come directly from Satan himself into our minds and thoughts, temptations. Believe this, you are not chosen, you're not loved. You are rejected, Art. You're not a good leader. You're not this. All these lies will be in all of our minds the moment we leave. They can be in your minds right now. And so I encourage you to follow the steps of David and pause and start proclaiming truths. We can proclaim truths because we're in God's word and we're reading truths about who he is. We're reading about truths of what he's done and we can rely on those things though our situations may seem like they're not true about him. So one way is to be in God's word. Another way is to be in prayer with God and talking with him, and he will reveal himself to you in regards to him and his character. Another is to be hearing his word shared among other believers, whether it's in a study or from the pulpit or from where else. Hearing truths of God is so important and will equip us in times where we are attacked in our minds. So David is doing that. He responds with three truths in the third Psalm, verses 3, or verse 3. Verse 4 says this. I'm going to read 4 and 5 together. It says, I cried out to the Lord, <clears throat> and he answered me from his holy mountain. <clears throat> For the Lord was watching over me. I'm not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surround me in every direction. Um, I read too far. Forgive me for that. Let's go back. Okay, so David says, I cried out to the Lord, verse 4. I cried out to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy mountain. So David cries out. And so as I read this, this challenged some theology for me. This challenged me in my relationship with God. Just so you guys know. David has... A nation against him literally and physically and he says I cried out to the Lord and he answered me from his holy mountain has his situation changed no you'll learn more because he continues to ask for help at the end but he says God has answered him already he has answered his cry for every cry we have, God answers 100%, always. Though it may not feel like it, he answers. I'm, I'm saying always, that's, that's a strong word, it's always, always. Now, <clears throat> where did the answer come from? What, is your, what does your scripture say? Where did the answer come from? It comes from his holy hill, his holy mountain. That holy mountain is Mount Moriah, right? You know what happened years after David on Mount Moriah? 
where this answer came from, what was built? Well, that's way later. I was getting to that punchline, my friend. You just stole my thunder right there. Dang. That's all good, brother man. The temple was built. Literally, God's presence, they believe, was in the Holy of Holies within this temple structure on Mount Moriah. That happened through David's son Solomon. And on that same mountain, some scholars believe, was the cross, Golgotha, Skull Mountain, or Skull Hill, where Jesus, the answer of God, speaks and brings a solution. And so for David, it's almost like these are prophetic words from David of what's going to happen a thousand years after him or two thousand years past from where we are today. The answer of God was spoken. If the answer of God was spoken, that means whatever situation in your life, we have all struggles in our lives, all of us. We can put them on the prayer requests, and I really love praying over your prayer requests. We can put them there, and it may feel like, you know what, I don't want to keep writing this. It's the same prayer request. Keep writing it. Keep praying it. Just because the situation hasn't changed doesn't mean that God's answer hasn't happened. Because ultimately, the answer for all of our problems is the cross. All of these temporal issues in our life are nothing in comparison to the cross. We've already been redeemed and seated at the right hand of the Father. This has been proclaimed in the New Testament. Yes, we have struggle. Yes, we have pain. Yes, we have all these issues that we want to be set free from and keep crying out to God in that. But know this, God has already answered. And the answer was his son. And his son was crucified to take care of the real issue in all of our lives. Defeating Satan, sin, and death. So here, David is praising God for answering his cry. Though his situation has not changed. He says, the Lord is watching over me. Which is a very intimate picture of that the Lord is, is caring for, is loving, is providing for the very thing that David needs. And what David needs in this moment is a, a, chi- a change of mind, peace in his, in his heart and mind in regards to the situation. And we see that the God provided that, God provided that. In verse 6, David proclaims, I am not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surround me on every side. That's beautiful. Now, verse 5, David says, I lay down and slept. How have you experienced Have you experienced uh, being able to sleep when your mind's spinning? When you're worrying about things? Like I know when there's a lot on my plate and I have a lot going on and and it's weighty and at night I'm trying to sleep and I'm laying there and it's like an hour and I'm like, okay, stop. I need to sleep. Stop. I need to sleep. Or when there's fear about something. Like how in the world can David, no person apart from the strength of God, can sleep in the midst of the chaos David is going through. And he says, I lay down and I slept, yet I woke up in safety. He trusted. You know this idea of, um, so some people have a drive to work and are really good at work ethic and they do, they get things done. There's like lists and it's like solid, right? Uh, Sometimes, people can't rest or take vacation because the fear is if I do then things won't get done if I'm not a part of this then everything in the world is going to fall off right and so that's that's the mindset and so for 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 people to vacation for people to sleep and rest and get real respite doesn't happen if we are trying to control those in, those environments of our life right and so David realizes this is outside of his control 
I've heard the lie, I've proclaimed the truth, now I'm going to lay down and sleep. And he did. And he woke up proclaiming truth, I'm safe. Right? And if you have a physical uh, situation going on where there's a physical element, like you're going to be attacked or something, it's really challenging to trust and just lie down and sleep. And this is what David experienced. He lied down, he slept, and he woke up in safety, knowing that the Lord is watching over him, though there's 10,000 enemies that surround him. And therefore he proclaims, I'm not afraid. Because the one who reigns over all things is protecting me. He's with me. He cares for me. So, so David is in this place, and I pray for us. Now, this isn't a blanket statement. There's so many issues going on with not being able to sleep, just so you guys know that. David was able to live this way, though there's 10,000 enemies that surround him. Now, I said it hasn't. But David's situation, I'm sharing this on purpose, hasn't changed yet. It's not changed. He still has enemies. He still is in the midst of an issue. But he has belief that these things are true about God. He protects me. He's my strength. He's my glory. These things are true about God. Therefore, once I start believing who God is and what he does, I can rest in him. Though my situation still exists. And he wakes up proclaiming more truth. I am not afraid of this situation, this issue, these 10,000 enemies in my life. Arise, O Lord, rescue me, my God. Slap all my enemies in the face. Shatter the teeth of the wicked. David cries out for justice. He cries out for a solution. Now he says, okay, I want you to respond to my literal situation. Please take this cup from me, basically. We've heard that from the words of our, our Lord Jesus. Take this cup from me. Another way, God. May there be another way, but your will be done. David cries out for justice. He wants the enemies to see God's wrath experience God's wrath. Slap them in the face, shatter their teeth. Verse 8, victory comes from you, O Lord. May you bless your people. So it's very personal with David all the way through. And then he says, not bless me, but bless your people. May your people, may those who trust you, who know you, who rest in you, who rely on you, be blessed. Now, the point of the whole psalm, the pinnacle of the psalm, is in this verse. In this battle, in this strife, we see David proclaim, victory comes from the Lord. We saw verse 4. The answer came from the holy mountain. And now he proclaims in verse 8, the victory is within God. Taking refuge in God, receiving his victory, is hinging on the answer that came from Mount Moriah in our lives. Now, as I'm asking myself the question, where is Jesus in the passage? We see Jesus being the answer, literally, in my quiet time, I'm reading this psalm. I'm going to try to find, well, where is Christ? Christ is the victory. He's the victor. Christ is the one who's the answer. That's where Christ is in the passage. Now, I want to share where else Christ is from the passage. I want us to reread this whole psalm together. I'm going to read this, and I want you guys to picture every single word that's being spoken as a word coming from Jesus' lips himself. Oh Lord, I have so many enemies. So many are against me. So many are saying, God will never rescue him. But you, oh Lord, are a shield around me. You are my glory. The one who holds my head high. 
I cried out to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept, yet I woke up in safety. For the Lord was watching over me. I'm not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surround me on every side. Arise, O Lord, rescue me, my God. Now these words, I hope you can picture Jesus proclaiming these words. Now I want you guys to help piece together with me, hearing these words of this passage, if they're truly proclaimed to the, the voice of the Lord, what aspects, what parts of his life can we look to and say, yep, that's true. He could have proclaimed it during this part of his life. He could have proclaimed it during this part of his life. I want you guys to help piece that together with me. What parts of his life could he have shared these words? Yep, yep, that's good. He could be proclaiming those words at that point in his life. Yeah. And he was standing before Pilate when they stumbled around, and uh, the whole crowd was just saying, crucify him. Yeah. So many against him. So many against him. On every side. Yep. Yeah. What else? Where else? I know Jesus wasn't able to talk at like one and a half, most likely. Um, but I think as many were out to kill him, uh, to crucify or to kill this king, this coming king, I see these words being able to be proclaimed about him when he, when there was an exit to Egypt for safety. These words could be proclaimed during that time of his life. What else comes to mind? I think in um, verse 5, when he says, I lay down and slept, that I woke up in safety. You could say that literally or metaphorically. Uh -huh. He died, but he slept and he woke up again. Come on. Come on. That's what I'm talking about. This is really good exercise for us. This is really good. You're right. Jesus, did God, did he spare his son's life? No. No, he didn't. He didn't spare Jesus' life. Jesus had to go through everything. God didn't rescue him from pain and suffering. He didn't rescue him from death. Though we pray for loved ones not to die, not to suffer, but when they do, may we not lose faith because our, our Lord wasn't spared either. And so Jesus did sleep and wake up in safety. How cool is that? Anything else come to mind? This is really good, you guys. What about when I slept in the boat in the storm? Yeah, slept in the boat. Trusted God in the midst of a storm. Yeah, why is he sleeping? That should come to mind. This is good. You, nobody's wrong in this. The whole point of this exercise is to be able to read any Old Testament passage and focus our attention and adoration to Christ and worship him. That's what this is all about. Anybody else have any other thoughts connected to Christ and being able to proclaim these words in the scriptures? Yeah. Rescue me, oh God. Take this cup from me. It's exactly another place I would go. Exactly. That's really good. He did. And he's going to claim victory when he comes back. Full victory over all sin. Eliminating the presence of sin. So as I read that verse, verse 8, I think of the cross. I think of resurrection. I think he can proclaim that then. But I think of when he comes back, 
on that white horse with flaming eyes with tattoos on his thighs. <laughs> Come on. When, when he comes back, he's going to proclaim that victory over all, forever. That's exactly right. This is good, you guys. I'm so blessed to hear you guys sharing these things. This is good. Um, I, uh, let's see. There's, there's a couple more connects in here. One is David. David cries out. David cries out these two things. Slap my enemies in the face. Jesus cries out to forgive his enemies. David says, shatter their teeth. And uh, Jesus says, you know, love your enemies, forgive your enemies, right? So his heart is full of grace. His heart is full of truth. And we see David, Jesus is the better David in this case. <clears throat> now there's a part that I didn't share because I've never tried to do this before, but I uh, there's a there's a there's a section in here that reminded me of um, a struggle that I absolutely hate. Um, I really like being used by God to help people, and there's a struggle in my life that I'm powerless to. And that struggle is mental illness. I can't help that. Um, and as I was going through this passage, I didn't know how to tie this together, <clears throat> but as I was going through this passage and I think of an ailment or a situation that continues to need prayer and continues to persist for many, is this depression, anxiety, this worry, this strife in our minds, and it breaks my heart. Um, this week I read an article <clears throat> that was speaking towards trauma-informed Bible reading. Trauma-informed, um, basically finding Christ in the midst of uh, being informed. So basically approaching the scriptures with this mindset, okay? And there's individuals who are trained to do this, and they did an experiment. So the Christianity Today has a magazine. They had an article they published, and they did an experiment on the East Coast among prisoners. This is post-COVID. This is recent. And they had two con a control group of people where they, they – I'll just read this. I'll read a snippet of this article, actually. Let me just read it. I'll just read it. Sorry. A group of 210 incarcerated men and women volunteered to take a five-session program where trained facilitators read scripture with participants and walked them through a process of identifying their pain, sharing it, and bringing their trauma to the cross of Christ for healing so they can be freed to care for themselves and serve others. It goes on. The participants answered questions about themselves and their mental health before, immediately after, one month after, and three months after finishing the program. Another group of 139 incarcerated people volunteered to take the survey without going through the program. Comparing the two groups, researchers found that the program showed statistically significant results. The study showed that the group that went through the program saw a drop in feelings of depression, anxiety, and anger, along with complicated grief, which includes denial of trauma events, negative effect, and avoiding activities associated with trauma. They also had less depression and fewer suicidal thoughts. This is so encouraging. And this is very different from just reading the Bible in general. Very different than that. I, when I read this, I thought of Healing Hearts. I thought of a ministry that's nationwide, that's connected, that John and Adina are connected to this ministry that helps people who've gone through trauma experience basically the cross in the midst of that trauma. And, uh, and so I was just really encouraged that Christ crucified 
that uh, answer came from Mount Moriah, uh, I believe that trauma-informed studying of God's word, finding Christ as the answer, is a huge part of solution to how we process and think and feel. Because as we navigate these pains, as we navigate these things, it's gonna hit our feelings. A lot of times, it's our feelings that drive our thinking and our actions. It, our feelings drive divorce. Our feelings drive suicide. I feel this way, and it's tied to our thoughts, and it's driven to these things. And I'm so grateful that Christ heals and speaks into those things. I printed out a short article um, of five comforts that come with the gospel connected to depression and anxiety. If you guys want this, I'll just pass it around. Can I give it to you and you guys just pass it around? I printed 15 copies, not knowing if everybody would want one. If you want one and didn't get one, let me know. Uh, I can hit print again. <clears throat> and I bring this up because it's a situation that continues to fester in people's lives. Uh, I see it among students when I'm teaching, when I'm subbing. I see it everywhere where it just continues to nag and pull, and it a lot of times dictates people's lives, and it breaks my heart. And so uh, I share that in regards to Jesus being the answer, the answer coming from Mount Moriah, and uh, hoping to be an encouragement for those who may struggle or people that you know in your life that struggles with mental illness. Uh, by God's grace, as we continue to pursue him in and through passages like this, the Holy Spirit will allow us to proclaim truth to the lies that we're faced with. And in that, we can have peace, internal peace in our hearts to the, to the, uh, to the place where we're able to physically rest and sleep. So, Father, we, we give you great thanks in regards to uh, how you've spoken to David. The freedom we see David being able to proclaim even uh, hatred almost towards his enemies. Uh, thank you for the, the freedom to be able to voice uh, anger and suffering. But God, more than anything, I thank you for the truths that lie within you and your character. And I pray for uh, not just uh, the Living Roots Church body, but the, the body of believers connected to our church family and beyond, may they be encouraged by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray over the people of peace, the non or pre-believers in our lives, that they would be affected and drawn to you in and through us. I pray that you would receive glory and praise Jesus. I pray you would receive the position of throneship, that you would be seated on the throne of our hearts, and I pray against pride among everyone in this room, myself included. I pray that we would be able to receive truth, receive correction, and walk in humility. I pray, Lord, that you would be so big that people would be flocking to you. God, reveal yourself more and more. We praise you today. We pray these things in Jesus' name.